up here in condition black. And we got loss of peripheral vision, loss of depth perception, loss of near vision. You lose in fine motor control. Is it really any surprise one place fine motor control goes to the eyes? Here's where it gets really interesting, auditory exclusion. Folks, uh, the vast majority of people in combat, the shots get quiet. And we've got a pretty good bunch of people here. Yeah, help me out, how many people in this room have ever been hunting? Yeah, pretty fair number. It, it's interesting how much hunters become hunters in other fields of the world as well. You understand? Mm -hmm. There's true cross-fertilization between these fields. All you hunters out there, you ever notice something? You shoot your hunting rifle at the range without hearing protection one time, years are going to ring. You go to shoot a deer, boom, people a mile away hear the shot. Hunter, what do you hear? Nothing. And your ears don't ring. Help me out. How many people here experience what we're talking about? Hunters, help me out. Yeah, that's a response. You're shooting a deer. A similar response would happen to the deer we're shooting back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not all of you are going to be engaged in close combat. But the shots get quiet in the heat of battle. You, they're, they're still there, but they're, they're very muted. And, and by the way, hunters, you are still getting hearing loss. And you need to be wearing hearing protection. But, but folks, uh, uh, how could we have spent 500 years of gunpowder combat and not let people know the simplest dang thing, like the shots will probably get quiet, yeah? Uh, we're just not learning this stuff. And so I call this the, 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 the warrior renaissance. It's a renaissance of knowledge an explosion of knowledge. And we've learned more about this whole psychology and physiology of the battlefield than in the last 50 years than the previous 5,000 years put together. And one of the things that we have learned in all these years of war is very important. If it works in the Olympics, if it works in the Super Bowl, it works when somebody's trying to kill you. Now, this is huge. Folks, there was... Uh, there was, I was at West Point in the early 1990s. Now you're, a, you're a smart guy for a brand new graduate degree. And they know you stand selected, get a smart stuff. Show us the latest stuff and go straight to the generals. And we said, look at all this performance psychology. Look at all this sports psychology. We got to use this stuff in combat. And the generals had a really good answer. No. <laughs> Just because it works in some stupid game doesn't mean it works in some that's trying to kill you. For all we know, that sports psychology might get you killed in combat. We didn't know. In 16 years of war, we have systematically experimented. This is huge. If it works in the Olympics, if it works in the Super Bowl, it works in somebody trying to kill you. Stress is stress. And, and, and the response is pretty consistent. So that means we can strip mine the field of performance psychology and apply it to the battlefield. The breathing is the most powerful tool I can give you. Our book, uh, uh, Warrior Mindset, uh, Dr. Mike Ashton did all heavy lifting on that book. A book, best book I've written in 30 years. If I could steal one book on the planet, put my name on it, call it my book, this would be the one, Secrets and Mental Marksmanship. I'm leaving a copy here for the eunuch and the, the opposite of the world. But uh, uh, they're a, a husband and wife team. They're both world championship shooters. He's a combat vet. They're hunters and hunting guides. Uh, they're law enforcement trainers. You could do your kid's basketball team with the factors they're talking about. But for every aspect of performance psychology, they give a military example, a law enforcement example, a hunting example, a competitive shooting example. Amazing body of work. The book is uh, temporarily out of print now. I'm the only one that has it. And I'll be the publisher in just a couple of months. I'll finally be a chance to work with it. The Paladin Press went out of business. But it's a great resource. We're leaving one here for the unit. Yeah. The other thing we've learned in all those years is the value of stress inoculation. Paint bullet for some force type engagements. The firefighter has to face real burning alloy fire in combat. If you're going to be in close combat, you have to face real burning alloy bullets. And uh, simulation, paint bullet for some force type training, bring us levels of performance we've seen before. One of the inventors of simulation is a guy named Ken Murray. I had the honor of writing a forward to his book, and we're leaving a copy of this too with the ops titles. Uh, just, just understand these things that are going on. So the application of performance psychology to the battlefield is, is, is just an blossoming field. We can, we can do a FDNY, Fire Department in New York, uh, bring me out quarterly for conferences where they're, they're taking all this, this performance psychology and applying it to the life and death environment of firefighters and other areas. We're putting that together. One last thing that's happening up here in Condition Black now. 
One last thing I want to talk about. In an extreme side of condition, black. Do that with your PowerPoint. Huh? And do it, I spit on your PowerPoint. <laughs> Voiding of bladder and bowels. Voiding of bladder and bowels. If you have a load in the lower intestines, extreme survival stress is probably going to go. Your body says bladder control, I don't think so. Sphincter control, we don't need no stink and sphincter control. Blow the ballast. <laughs> <laughs> so one major survey of World War II, major survey of World War II, approximately 20% of the veterans of intense combat would admit they messed themselves at one time or another. About half the veterans of intense combat would admit they wet themselves at one time or another. These are the ones who would admit it. One old World War II vet told me one time, hell, all that proves. 80% were what? Liars. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Happened to him. Uh, we're not so sure they were liars, not for us to say. But understand that it's the body's response. You know, I do in-service training. I, like I said, just last Friday in Maine, I had like 300 uh, a hospital in emergency room and, and, uh, and EMS uh, uh, docs. And, uh, and I asked them, what ratio of traffic accident victims have messed themselves? And the number's all over the map, but it's very common. And people are devastated by this. So uh, a little, you say that's your body's natural response. It happens all the time. It goes a long way. So I tell my cops, you know, if it ever happens to you in this good, violent, close-inch engagement, uh, don't be devastated. Don't be destroyed. Tell yourself it happened at least one out of five of the kids in World War II. Change your drawers and rock on. <laughs> one old cop said, yeah. And bag it as evidence. <laughs> Could you see it in court? Were you sincerely in fear for your life? Well, exhibit it. <laughs> All right, so what we've outlined through you is kind of a, a continuum. At one end is condition yellow. At the other end is extreme condition black. The body blows that toxic waste. Inside every human body is a toxic waste site, and it's under pressure. It's very, very reasonable for the body to dump that toxic waste and relieve that pressure before life and death event. So we've outlined through you this spectrum, and, and it's all about being forewarned and forearmed. But what I want to do now is, uh, is put a couple of nuts and bolts together. How many of you will be in a close range gunfight and, and, and dealing with these kind of things? But if we prepare for that highest end, then the ones lower down the spectrum become all the more easy. Do you understand? So, one thing that happens, and you know, I've seen this so many times, I am convinced we're wired this way. There can be a sudden violent death, the sudden violent death of a family member, the sudden violent death of a, of a fellow on, on your military team. And the very first response is, oh, that could have been me. That could have been me. Afterwards, you look back at yourself. I wish it was me. I would have laid my life down for that person. And my very first thought, was this selfish one about myself. I've heard this so many times that I am convinced we're wired this way, for a good reason. Think about it. You're in an aircraft with a small child. Oxygen mask comes down. What do you have to do for, with the child's mask on? Put your mask on first. It is a fundamental law of survival. Before you can help anybody else survive, what do you have to do first? Survive yourself. The most amazing survival machine the world has ever seen. A human brain. And we're wired for survival. When there's a sudden violent death, the puppy says, Oh, that would have been us. Pay attention. If that ever happens here, I don't want you to be troubled by it. I want you to be forewarned and recognize it. That's just the way we're wired. And so, folks, take a look at the way people are responding now. Dr. Alexis R. Walls, a police psychologist in Portland, Oregon, she surveyed 141 cop appearances in combat. 85% of the shots got quiet. But 16% had intensified sounds. Even old soldiers figure out that adds up to 101%. <laughs> Usually what happens is you're caught by surprise in an ambush. Boom, boom, boom. Shots overwhelming. But return fire, shots get quiet. There can be a time in the gunfight when the shots get quiet. It's almost always being a return fire. The body will focus intensely on the sense it needs most for survival. When you start shooting back, the eyes turn on, the ears turn off, and the shots get quiet. 
And, and, and again, whether you're in a therapeutic mode, whether you're in, in, a, in a life and death event over here, whether you're deployed over there, being forewarned and forearmed about these things are terribly important. You see, the next step in resiliency is to be forewarned and forearmed about what the body's gonna do in these life and death events. Tunnel vision, folks, most people talk about looking through a toilet paper tube. Now, the bad guys experience this stuff too. And we know rapid lateral movement can take you right off the bad guy's radar screen. When, when I teach small arms, uh, I, I, I teach it, you sidestep with your draw. To not sidestep when you draw is the exception. The bad guy has tunnel vision. Remember Officer Greg Stevens? They fired 30 rounds at him. He fired a volley of shots and moved. Volley of shots moved. Volley and moved. And every time he moved, he came off their radar screen. Do you understand? Shooting created extreme stress in their part. You know, it, it, I mean, a whole lot more extreme than getting hit. And, and, and then he moved and came off their radar screen. So the tunnel vision is powerful stuff. Slow motion time. Oh, uh, autopilot. Three out of four cops of one time or another did what they're trained to do without conscious thought. Is that a good thing? If you're trained to do the right thing, it is. For a century, we had revolvers out of the range because we didn't have to clean up the range afterwards. We'd fire six shots out of a revolver, put the brass in your hand, put the brass in your pocket, reload and keep going. Pretty clever. Police range as we go. We found case after case where cops had in the gunfight but the pocket full of brass, no idea how it got here. <laughs> in the New Hall incident in California, we had dead California Highway Patrol officers with brass in their pocket. They did exactly what they're trained to do. You know, you gotta admire the cop who's willing to share this story with me. He said, me and my partner would do five minutes of survival training every day before the street. And again, for your security forces, that's a neat idea. One thing a day, one thing a day. Uh, one defensive tactic move. You do a lot in five minutes a day. He said, one of the things we did periodically was weapons take away. My partner hold the rubber gun, the blue gun, you know, take it away, hand it back, take it away, hand it back, 10 reps. I'd hold the gun, take it away, hand it back, 10 reps. He said, we did that off and on across the years. One day I'm in a store, come around the corner, someone's robbing the store. Without anyone, he's showing a shotgun on my face. Without conscious thought, took it away, hand it back. <laughs> <laughs> Trigger ourselves to do. Slow motion time. I am convinced the slow motion time is real. I have had hundreds of people tell me they can see the bullet in combat. And it freaks them out. It's kind of like airsoft or slow if you drop your eyes and I believe it. Memory loss. Half of all trained seasoned cops had gaps in the memory. Now folks, uh, I, uh, uh, we, had, we had the most horrendous year over year increase in cops murders in the history of our nation. Every year, cops have better body armor, better tactics, better training. The only good assessment of the problem is the year-over-year -year increase in cops' murder. Over any period of time, the comparison breaks down. Now, last year, we had a 61% increase in cops' murder. I, we've never seen anything like this. But uh, five cops murdered in Dallas, four cops murdered in Baton Rouge, and bad times. And, uh, but in this case, the bad guy was coming to murder the cops' family. And that's the world we're in. But Mama Bear met him with a load of double up buck in the face. Game over. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I tell people, we carry a pistol around because the rifle's a pain in the butt and hard to conceal. Yeah? When you're home, you had to choose the weapon. They were bird hunters. You know? and she knew how to make her, her shotgun sing, and, and it was game over. Yeah? But she said, uh, she said, I was completely messed up. She said, I heard the audio tape on my 911 call, and to this day, I have no memory of it. I didn't hear the shot. I didn't feel the recoil. And I mean, it was tearing her apart. And somebody said, you, you need to read the book. They gave her the book, read the book. She said, you know, one of the most powerful healing words in the universe, that's normal. Yeah. That's your body's normal response. It's one thing to help cops out uh, and, and, uh, and our troops out, to help their spouse in their hour of greatest need. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. We'll talk more about those, uh, those memory losses, how we can deal with that in the debriefing. And the memory distortions, 22% just flat remember something that did not happen. Usually little things. You know, it was early in the war, one of our tier one spec ops medics at the first combat tour, he asked me, he said, why do the wounded hallucinate so much? I'm blind, I'm paralyzed, I'm gonna die. And he said, you know, under stress, we envision possibilities. And what we envision possibility can become reality. 
So set aside the fact that somebody's trying to kill you. Set aside the fact that somebody's trying to kill you. If you were sitting here right now, boom, don't be on fire. Blackout. <laughs> Hallucinations. That would meet every definition of a psychotic episode. Just those things by themselves would scare the daylights out of you. The fact that somebody's trying to kill you is bad enough without your body doing weird and one of the things nobody warned you about. But if you've been warned that might happen, then they won't blindside you, yeah? Young California Highway Patrol officer, been in my class, he'd been forewarned. He and his partner in a traffic stop. Bad guy murders his partner. He applies CPR to his dead partner. He said, you cannot imagine how important it was in the heat of the gunfight that know that it was normal for my shots and the bad guy's shot to be so muted. He said, the tunnel vision was like looking through a soda straw. Autopilot, holstering, unholstering, his conscious thought was freaky. The slow motion time was freaky. It was so important to be warned. And the memory loss. He said, during the debriefing, folks, the debriefings are important. I know many of you, the debriefing is a critical piece of the equation. And in the debriefing, we fill in the memory gaps and we sort out the memory distortions. He said, during the debriefing, people talk about things I didn't remember. And I was okay with that. And then memory distortions. He said, there were one or two things I thought I had done wrong in treating his partner. His partner was brain dead. His partner leaned in for a driver's side approach. Bad guy shot in the mouth. Bullet went in the mouth, hit the brain stem. He was dead before he hit the ground. Now, he didn't know that at the time. In retrospect, he knew that nothing could do for a partner. And yet, he was kicking himself for one or two little things he thought he had done wrong. And people there said, no, man, that didn't happen. He said, if I didn't know this kind of memory distortion could happen, I would have spent the rest of my life thinking they all conspired to lie to me about some goofy little aspect of what happened. Yeah. So folks, the debriefings are terribly important. And we fill in the memory gaps, sort out the memory distortions. But there's something else we do, too. There's a formula, pain shared equals pain what? Divided. Joy shared <coughs> equals joy what? Multiply. Yeah. You know what? Don't we do that in humans? My, 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 we buried my dad quite a while ago, and we laughed a lot at the funeral. You ever laugh at a funeral? Remember the good things? Remember the happy times? And you, you laugh. We, we, we multiplied our joy and divided our pain. There were a lot of tears. There was a lot of laughter. And that won't do a funeral. And so these debriefings, on top of everything else here, you multiply your joy and divide your pain and make it possible to, to, to live with whatever happens in the incident. Well, these debriefings are important. And, and in his case, it was during the debriefing those things fell into place and, and all came together. So, folks, it's important to be forewarned about what happens in the event. But we kind of expect crazy things in the heat of battle. When crazy things happen days or weeks later, and they come out of nowhere, they can scare the daylights out of you, unless you've been warned. So when you were a kid, how many times did you have to touch a hot stove? Hot stove, how many times? <laughs> just once, unless you're destined to be an army paratrooper, just once. <laughs> <laughs> you touch that hot stove, ah, your heart rate skyrockets, the poor brain shuts down, and the puppy blows a hole through the screen door. <laughs> That little dog lives out the front yard, punch hole the screen door, grabs you by the throat, pees in your lap, said, don't ever touch that stove again. Does it work? It's called one trial learning. Whenever there's fear and pain associated with learning, a neural pathway, a powerful network of neurons is established. If you think a neural pathway was established from touching a hot stove, how much greater might it be from combat? Arkansas State Trooper, first gunfight, bad guy's down, he's alive, happy ending of the story. He said, the week after my first gunfight, I'm sitting up in the bleachers with my wife, watching our daughter at a swim meet. What do you suppose pushed this guy's button? His daughter's pistol went off when I didn't expect it. Boom! <coughs> my heart is pounding, a master of air, and drenched with sweat. His wife thought he was having a heart attack. It's not hard, it's a panic attack, a little mild anxiety attack. They threw the same thing, the puppy's coming for a visit. Huh? <laughs> when he was in that gunfight, the puppy blew a hell of a hole through the screen door. Huh? And, 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 and a week later, a random gunshot goes off, and here's the puppy saying, no, my gunfight! This guy had two things working against him. Nobody warned him that might happen. Number two, nobody taught him what to do. I'm warning the puppy might come for a visit. It 
is not PTSD. It's normal. How you respond to it could become PTSD. Do you understand? But having a puppy come or visit is normal. So, uh, you know, my Arkansas State Trooper was, was pretty messed up. Nobody wanted what might happen. And, 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 and nobody taught him what to do. The goal is to separate the memory from the emotions. And the shortcut is to leash in that puppy is the breathing. The tool to leash in the puppy is the breathing exercise. What's the shortcut to get people to breathe? Big swig of water. Okay? All right, so uh, let me give you an example of some people who were forewarned. Uh, trained a Marine Battalion. I've had the honor to be training a, a brigade in Hawaii this coming Monday. Had the honor to train a whole battalions and brigades in the shop year after year. These guys were forewarned. And a Marine gave me a great back brief. He said, uh, he said we, we went to Iraq, saw a hell of a lot of combat, and came home. He said, I'm sitting having a beer with my, a bunch of my Marine buddies. You know, bring it over beer. It can be healthy. You know, whiskey's made for sipping. Wine's made for sipping. Beer is made for gulping. Yeah? <laughs> and talking over beer, you're going to lose it. What do you do? Stop. <sighs> Regain control. Keep talking. Just about, I mean, physiologically, psychologically speaking, just about one of the best things you could possibly do. If you get drunk, then it gets counterproductive. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, me and my buddies talking over beer, and one of my buddies said he said, been home for less than a week. Or dark third of the morning. Then he sleep in bed with my wife, and they emptied the dumpster right outside our apartment. Sounds like incoming artillery. <laughs> I wake up on a dead sleep, heart pounding, roll off the bed, hit the deck, scrambling under the bed, for right on him with the spot there. And I come up armed with uh, my slippers. <laughs> we all laugh, we had a beer. He said, one more what he said that would be, real common one. So I've been home for a couple of weeks. I'm walking down a busy city sidewalk with the wife and kids. Heavy traffic in the street, cars parked by the curb, I'm by the curb, wife and kids, something backfires loud, no warning. Boom! Next thing I know, I'm in the gutter, under a car. Look up, there's the wife and kids. Ah, it's okay. This is normal. <laughs> <laughs> We're going this one, haven't We all laugh. We had a beer. Yeah, almost identical example, almost identical. A uh, young soldier told me, he and his little three-year-old boy, car backfires, hits it. He said, I looked up my little three-year-old boy. His eyes are this big, looking down. So I got up my knees, put my hand on the boy's shoulder. I said, those are called combat reflexes. They kept that alive in combat. It would take a while for that to go away. Yeah? For the next month, any loud noise, boom, the kid's hitting the dirt. All the neighbors, <laughs> all the neighbor kids, boom, they're all hitting the dirt. Go, go back to my Marine. We're laughing, we had a beer. Then he said, one of my buddies said something really important. He said, you know, we have been warned this might happen. We wouldn't be laughing. We hadn't been warned this might happen. We wouldn't be laughing. Laughter can be cruel, laughter can be appropriate, but most of the time, laughter is very healthy. It says this has no power over me, yeah? So folks, uh, my son comes back from his first combat tour, uh, invasion of Afghanistan, a new young combat controller, and the one book I made him read was an early draft of On Combat. The one thing I'd like any, anybody to have is On Combat before they go in harm's way. So he was forewarned, he grew up with all of this while I was writing the book. And while Big Brother was deployed, Little Brother put a poster of Yoda on the outside of Little Brother's bedroom door. Big Brother gets up the night and sees Yoda. Whatever reason, sees the bad guy. Heart pounding, goes for his gun, realizes it's Yoda, no big deal. <laughs> Next morning at breakfast, said, Dad, it happened. The puppy came for a visit. Got in the night, saw Yoda, saw a bad guy, heart pounding, went for my gun. He said, You know, he turns to Little Brother, while I'm home, take Yoda down. <laughs> little Brother puts Yoda in Big Brother's closet. <laughs> <laughs> it was sincerely funny. What's next? The toilet? <laughs> and we could laugh about it. And it was so healthy to be able to laugh about it. But it scares the daylights out of me to think how we might respond it if we hadn't been warned. Do you understand? We can use this stuff afterwards to fill in the gaps. But we want to give it to people ahead of time. A handful of vaccines with a carload of antibiotics. We, we want to be vaccinated. We want to be forewarned about these things. When they happen, they won't blindside us, and, and we can laugh over a beer about them without any big deal. All right, so the tool we're using to leash in the puppies is a breathing exercise. It's not enough to teach how to breathe. 
I've got to explain to you why and how the season works. So for our purpose right now, divide your body into two parts. The, the conscious and the unconscious. Now, what kind of things are not under conscious control? Heart rate, blood pressure, digestion. What do you think? Can you control those? Never know if you never try. <laughs> right now, give, give your best shot. Raise your heart rate to 200 beats per minute. Raise your blood pressure, and everybody give it some good stress diarrhea. Ready? <laughs> Couldn't do that good. But those are fight or flight responses. Those are things the puppy does. The body divides into things you control. The conscious, the thing the puppy controls, the unconscious. What's, what, what's one biological mechanism that could go either way? You're breathing, sure. Your breathing right now is not under conscious control. If you had a conscious you control your breathing, when you sleep, you die, yeah? But you're gonna breathe in through the nose. Breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Let it out, let it out, let it out, let it out. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, okay. What'd you just do? You pulled your breathing from unconscious to conscious control. Folks, you can control your heart rate. You can control your blood pressure if you control your breathing. For, on Amazon.com for 20 bucks, you got a little finger clip gives your heart rate. I sit there watching TV and run my heart. I can hyperventilate, get my heart rate down 200. No big deal. And then nice and slow and bring it down. Run it up, bring it down. Yeah? The other day, they go on for a colonoscopy. That's where they shove a camera up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and baby, I was wired for sound. I had my, I had my blood pressure, my heart rate going. I thought, man, this is so cool. I, I, I run my blood pressure up, bring it down. Run it up, bring it down. Or wipe this back on me. Stop that. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can control those things if we control our breathing. Now, you understand why the breathing works? It's you gaining conscious control of the unconscious part of your body. Now, folks, uh, we're doing this stuff to, to kids. You can teach little children to breathe in at a young age, and it's powerful. They do it with a candle and a flower, and you model the behavior, smelling the flower, enjoy it, blow out the candle, watch the smoke. Now you do it. That fast, you have a two-year-old breathing on command. And, 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 and so with, what we're doing, though, is, uh, is we're doing this. We're doing what we call combat breathing or tactical breathing. And we're breathing in through the nose for four count, hold for four count, out through the lips for four count, hold for four count, again and again. It's often called square breathing, four by four. But folks, what we're gonna do is while you breathe, we're gonna have the <coughs> eyes open. Now say, have your eyes open, and there'll be someone with the eyes closed. You train to shoot, breathe with your eyes closed, that's what you do, keep the eyes open. This is a combat breathing. Bad guy's still there even if we have our eyes closed, yes? <laughs> and one of the things we're going to do is unscrew the natural stress response. A newborn baby has that response. Head goes down, shoulders come up. Newborn baby does that. Pull the head back. Pull the shoulders back. While you breathe, try to fill the lungs absolutely full. For the lungs to get completely full, the diaphragm has to push the belly out of the way and the stomach has relaxed a little bit for that to happen. Just work on that. Now folks, we're using the breathing before the life and death event. LAPD, SWAT, FBI, HRT, both tell me they're stacked up outside the door. That I don't know that they're there. They got a second. What's the last thing they do before they go in that door? They go in the door conditioning level, calm, calm, but professional. Anything goes wrong, they pop a bread, rock and roll, come back down again. But they go in that door too excited. They go in that door amid the high condition red. Anything goes wrong, where are they going? Straight to black. So we're using the breathing before the event, we're using it during the event. A West Virginia state trooper came up to me and said, of all the thousands of people you're walking past in a lifetime, one of them draws a gun and tries to kill you. He says, I admit, this guy caught me completely flat footed. I went straight to condition black. I just yanked my gun out and I'm shooting back. I'm spraying and praying. He said, the only good news is the bad guy was an even worse shot than I was. <laughs> he said, I dumped a magnet at this guy. My slide locked back. My weapon's empty. I'm completely out of control. And I did exactly what I was trained to do. Went to cover, did a magazine change. The cover, go to cover. The not cover, sidestep into a magazine change. I went to cover, did a magazine change. Go to pop out. I said, wait a minute, he ain't going nowhere. 
I got time for a free throw. I got time for a free throw. He said, all it took was one breath. Front side, game over. Front side press, one of the best shots I've ever made in my life. He says, I accomplished more with one breath and one careful shot than spraying and praying a magazine. Or use the breathing before the event, during the event, and when? After the event. For the rest of your life. If the puppies come up for visit, the anger is welling up, the fear is welling up, you now have a leash on the puppy. You must make a conscious decision to use that leash, yeah? Here's the heart goal. Here's the soul. Controlling fear in combat, controlling fear after combat is the same skill. Just nobody warned about how to do it. What's courage on the battlefield? Is courage the absence of fear? Oh, no. Most people in combat are very afraid. General Patton said, any man that ain't never afraid in combat, a damn liar. Patton also said that courage is the absence of fear, that I have never met a courageous man. Courage is controlling your fear. It breaks my heart to see brave men and women, strong men and women, people who are brave in the incident, who are blindsided after the incident, because nobody warned them they might have to be brave afterwards. The breathing works in the event, the breathing works after the event. Let's knock it out real fast now. Here we go. In through the nose for four count, hold for four count, out through the lips for four count, hold for four count again, again. Remember, eyes open, head back, shoulders back, three breaths. Here we go. Fill those lungs completely full. In through the nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Out through the lips, two, three, four, hold, two, three. In through the nose, deep, 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 hold, two, three, four. Out through the lips, deep, 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 hold, two, three, four. In through the nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Out through the lips, two, three, four, hold. Two, three, four. Simple as that are true revolution. Attitude is contagious. Can panic be contagious? Can calm be contagious? And every one of us, in whatever your task is, whether it's a maintainer under pressure trying to get that, that craft back in action, whether it's a, a, a sensor operator or a pilot maintaining those fine motor controls, whether it's a leader or, or a therapist, all of us have got to remain calm in the heat of battle. When things are coming unglued, we have to manifest calm. You understand? And the breathing is a tool that makes it possible. And again, we're striving for that, that realm of quiet professionals. You understand? And the breathing is a tool that will keep us in that zone. Well, folks, in the final half hour, I'm going to tie it all up. A couple of great destroyers from the years after the battle. When we're all weary, a couple of things are weigh upon us. Starting in 1988, you know, World War II vets, Korea, Vietnam vets. I would present to reunions of hundreds of them and conduct surveys and interviews. One of our work with those World War II vets and those Vietnam vets and just tiny, tiny number of Korea vets, they told me what I'm about to tell you is the most valuable thing I had to give them. If they, they say this is the most important thing I had to give them. Is it worth five minutes of our time? What do you think? I think, I think maybe so. Thou shalt not kill. Question mark. Remember I told you was study people who do not get PTSD? Holocaust survivors and POWs. And the one thing they mentioned over and over again was their faith was a vital component. If you're not wired that way, there's other skin that can. But it is a simple historical scientific fact that comes up over and over again. Faith can be a vital component in resiliency. Yeah? That, and, and all your life, on movies and television, you've seen somebody waving a black book and shouting, thou shalt not kill. If that's all you know, and you have to kill somebody, you can kick your tail. If you think even a little bit, you might be going to hell for the lawful use of deadly force that is not conducive to good mental health. Yeah. 
Now let me ask you a question, now think about it. It's World War II, and we killed millions of the enemy in World War II. Now the world would be a dark and desperate place today if we hadn't fought and won in World War II, yes? So think about it, were all of our religious leaders in World War II a bunch of hypocrites? Think about it. Did all of our pastors and priests and ministers and rabbis and chaplains, did they all preach, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill, the war began, oh, we all changed our mind and killed those guys, it's cool. No, that's not what happened. 99% of our religious culture for 5,000 years have believed the proper application, the proper translation is you shall not murder. All the Jewish translations, original Hebrew, commandments, original Hebrew. All the Jewish translations translate, shall not murder. Almost all the modern translations translate, you shall not murder. Thou shalt not kill, come with the King James Bible, come out in the year 1611, 40 years ago. Want to stick with the King James? Go to Matthew 19, 18, where they transfer the Greek in their precise language. Jesus is running through the commandments, and Jesus says, thou shalt do no murder. <coughs> Is there a difference between what the terrorists did in that school in Russia? Is there a difference between what happened in that school in Russia and those who hunt down the, the evil ones who, who, who do these acts? It's all the difference in the world. And if you can tell the difference, maybe God can too. Yeah. And if there is a God, and there's a God in the Bible, he says so over and over again. There's verse after verse. This is all in all combat. Ultimately, Jesus said it best. Greater love is no one than this, that they give their life for their friends. And the men and women who put their life in harm's way that others may live have never received anything but the highest honor from 99% of a religious culture for the last 5,000 years. So you may not need all this stuff. It's, it's in on combat. Uh, they, uh, they actually turn it into online course, GrossmanAcademy.com, GrossmanAcademy.com. Online course, get e copy of the book, work you all the way through the book, and we're just skimming the surface of the book today. And uh, everybody's got a Bible somewhere. Tab a couple verses, help somebody get that right. You ain't got a Bible? Steal one for the next hotel room, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chaplin says he's got you covered. Chaplin's got you covered. All right, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. A lot of those guys killed them was hard. A lot of those guys were 18 year old kids. Drafted off the street, a few short months later, killed some guy in government real hard. For a lot of those kids, killing was hard. But I am convinced from a lifetime of study, if you properly prepare yourself, killing is just not that big a deal. For a mature warrior who's prepared themselves mind, body, spirit for a lifetime. For a mature warrior who's killing somebody who's a clear and present danger to others, it's just not that big a deal. There's no wrong way to respond to killing this. Many of those people respond, and they're all okay. I think if you could choose how you responded, you want to feel good about it. The satisfaction of hitting the target under the stress of combat, the fact that you saved people's lives, you stopped a threat to others. And, and some people feel bad, they don't feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> LAPD brought me out a little while back to do a detective in-service day. LAPD detective in service day was 600 people. And a seasonal old female LAPD detective came up. She said, she said, Colonel, you're the first one in 30 years to tell me it's okay to not feel bad about killing that guy. For those who put a prepared themselves, it's just not a big deal. But I can't tell you how many warriors have bumped me across all these years of war. Said, I like killing bad guys in this war, and I believe it. They got no problem killing bad guys, I believe it. Had to leave some friends over there. Got like let go of them. That's the hard part. Survivor club. When we're old and weary, it's our comrades that didn't make the way upon us. The ultimate question, why am I alive and they're dead? They used a critical concept up front. Survivor guilt is not PTSD. It's normal. It's hard. It's grieving. It's loss. It's hard. But it's normal. In the normal cycle of life, we will all bury our parents. Is there anything more normal in the cycle of life than have your parents die before you do? Yes? It's normal. But it's hard. In most people's lives, one of the hardest things you will ever do is bury your mom and dad. You understand? 
It's normal, but it's hard. I buried my mom and my dad one right after the other. I had a couple of hard years. Was that PTSD? I was grieving. And, and, and so don't get them mixed up, folks. And there are people who can help with grieving. And it's normal, but it's hard. When a human being steals that comrade's life away, it can be far harder to live with. You tell me now, is there a difference between these two scenarios? You tell me. <coughs> Scenario one, a tornado hits a house while you're gone, puts your family in the hospital. How do you feel about that one? Thank God they're alive. Yeah. Scenario two, a gang hits a house while you're gone and beats your family in the hospital. Now you feel any different? Any different? It's all the difference in the world. One's an act of nature, the other is intentional. A 9-11 terrorist murdered 3,000 of our citizens. The stock market crashed, our way of life changed forever. That same year, 30,000 Americans died in traffic accidents. Didn't change nothing. They were accidents, you understand? When a human being steals that comrade's life away, and there is a bond of love among men and women who put their lives on the line together. The average person cannot comprehend. We're like family. Family bickers and squabbles and fights. When the chips are down, family will die for each other. Yes? When someone steals that comrade's life away, there's two ways we can spend out of control. One is inappropriate aggression towards others. Two is inappropriate aggression towards yourself. But now, at the end of the day, we put two last pieces in the book of mind in place. Justice on vengeance and life, not death. And justice on vengeance simply says this. You have sworn a solemn oath to justice. Vengeance will destroy us. All these Israeli research, all the military research, all the law enforcement research says there's one action we cannot live with. And remember, PTSD can be the gift that keeps on giving. The one act most likely to destroy us and our loved ones is to commit a violent criminal act. Whatever we think we're avenging is not worth the price, ourself, our spouse, our children, yes. And folks, uh, there was a time training the troops going back and forth from the war, and they talked a lot about Abu Ghraib. You know, that was over 14 years ago, that prison in Iraq, uh, American soldiers abused some Iraqi prisoners, took photographs of them. A new generation doesn't remember that one. They, that's good. Let that one go. But it was in newspapers and magazines around the planet. And it did us great harm. Back in those days, I remember one young soldier calling them the seven idiots who lost the war for us. We ain't lost that war in Iraq. They're still hanging in there. But the seven fools in that prison did us more harm than every terrorist on the planet when those photographs appeared on the cover of every newspaper, every magazine on the planet. So you listen now. You listen. In a lifetime of virtuous, honorable service, you will touch thousands of lives. In a lifetime of honorable service, positive echoes will ripple down across the generation from you. But in one moment of stupidity, you can do more harm than every terrorist in America put together in this day. Yes. That'd be known throughout the land. That'd be known. You don't want to play this game by the rules. Then get to hell out of our game. There's too much at stake to lose it all because of one idiot. Oh, by the way, this is now a nationally televised game. Everything thing you do, in pitch black to a thermal imager, every action we can engage in will, not, will be on BBC, Al Jazeera, CNN, and YouTube tomorrow morning. You don't have to like it, you've got to accept it. There's cameras and umpires everywhere. You've got to play the game by the rules. People say, well, the bad guy won't play by the rules. That's why he's the bad guy. That's why a coalition of nations are gathered together to hunt them down around the planet, because they don't want to play by the rules. If we don't want to play by the rules, get a cage for us too. Do you understand? And remember I told you you swore a solemn oath to justice? Somebody said, no, nah, Dave, we're not cops. We, we didn't swear an oath to justice. Well, many of you swore an oath to support and amend the Constitution, to obey the law of the Lord of Souls pointed over you. That's justice. But that's not the oath I'm talking about. There's another oath, an older oath, the deeper oath. An oath we swore from our youngest days. An oath that says everything it means to be an American. Let me remind you that oath. You stay seated. Help me out at the key point. You'll win. Stay seated. Help me out at the key point. You'll win. It went like this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and 
for all. Justice for all. We do not violate an oath we think of from our youngest days without paying a profound price. Tell yourself right now, whoever I think I'm avenging, whatever I think I'm accomplishing, it's not worth the price. Myself, my spouse, my children, everything my comments are fought and died for. That can be undone in one moment of stupidity. You know, last year they brought me out to L.A. to speak at a boxing arena. Big boxing audience, a couple hours. And, uh, and we had a meet and greet afterwards. And a rising young contender, young boxer with family there, mom is there, and family there. And a young boxer comes out of nowhere and says, what do you think about vengeance versus justice? I never mentioned this topic. I said, well, vengeance will destroy you. He said, what if justice is not doing the job? Now, mom is on the edge of tears. Mom said, this kid's talking crazy talk. This guy's going to do something stupid. And I told him, you swore a solemn oath to justice from the younger state. He said, what? I said, yeah. I said, you swore an oath. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. It's for all. I said, you do not violate an oath you've taken from the younger states without paying a profound price. He repeated that back word for word. And, and mom is heaving this sigh of relief. Finally, somebody could talk sense to this boy. Finally, somebody could talk to this boy. I think there's great power in reminding people that oath. I think if the day ever comes, our children don't say that oath. That, that'll be a sad day. So we dedicate ourselves to justice on business around the planet. I love, I love hunters bring justice around the planet. You understand? <coughs> we dedicate ourselves to justice on business. And life, not death. And life, not death, simply says this. If I give my life to save your life, don't you dare waste it. Think now when you're calm and rational. Think it through. If you are the one to die, and your loved ones are coming as you're getting on with life, you're dead. Everybody you care about is getting on with their lives. What do you want for your loved ones after you're gone? Happiness and joy. The fullest, richest, best life they can have. That's what you lived and fought and died to give them, yes? That they're the ones that died. And you're driving on. They're dead. You're getting on with life. What do they want for you? After they're gone, what do they want for you? After they're gone. The same thing. The fullest, richest, best life you can have. That's what they lived and fought and died to give us. That means right now you dedicate yourself to that full, rich life that was fought at such a price. And right now, confront the possibility of suicide. Chew it up, spit it out. Say, suicide? They were in hell that cover. I never eat my gun. Well, year after year in this war, we lose more troops for them to their own hand than we do to the enemy. Every one of them would have sworn that every eat their gun, the world came unglued. And they, they, they made a bad decision, and they get a chance to rethink it. So we all agree on one thing. I think every living creature can agree on one thing. Nobody takes your life without a fight. Give me a sea of head nods on that one. We can all agree on that one. Every living creature, nobody takes your life, including you, without a fight. Tell yourself right now, I will fight for my life. I will seek counseling. I will get medication. I will leave no rock unturned. I will fight for my life or go fight for my child's life. Because no one takes my life, including me, without a fight. Burn it in your soul. I will fight for my life. I will seek counseling. I will get medication. I will leave no rock unturned. I will fight for my life or go fight for my child's life. Because no one takes my life, including me, without a fight. Burn it in your soul. At the moment of truth, your warrior spirit will guide you through. We we'll wrap up the day. We come full cycle. This photograph again. There. Okay. There we go. We we'll wrap up the day. We come full cycle to the photograph we began with here. And uh, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, in through the nose, two, three, four. Hold two, three. Four. Uh, that's just another day in the office. <laughs> You know, we wrap up the day, we come full cycle with the photograph we began with. I want you to look at this young man with fresh eyes. Again, you see the vasoconstriction in his face. 
But what do we know about him? Is the blood drained from the face, the blood drains from the forebrain, and there is no rational thought of that man's head. Can you accept that? Remember that. We'll come back to it. There is no rational thought of that man's head. His name is Christopher Amoroso. Amoroso. Remember that. We'll come back to it. By this point, on that awful day, the smoke and the flames are so intense, they're leaping from those buildings in waves. If people are there tell me the media never properly captured it. They were coming down from both towers. They were coming down from all four sides. Strangers were holding hands on the way down, comforting one another in that awful final sector. It takes a long time to die from 90 floors up. Every second is filled with despair. The sky behind him is filled with fallen bodies. The air above him is filled with smoke and flames. And the awful sound of those bodies hitting the sidewalk are echoing in his ears. Now, you understand why it looks like that? What makes him different from her? What's he going to do that she's not? He's going back. Do you understand there's no rational thought of that man's head? Do you understand nobody told him to go? People tried to stop him from going. He's been cut. He's been burned. He's exhausted. People tried to stop him from going. <coughs> I get this vision of a, of, of a mother just going into the burning building to rescue her children. That kind of, that kind of, that kind of unstoppable force. And, and Christopher Amoroso will go back in that building a third time. The building will fall. And he will not come home to his wife and baby tonight. He'll never come home again. Now, do you understand there's no rational thought of that man's head? Do you understand nobody told him to go? People tried to stop him from going. Why does one person go up the steps again and again and again? Well, thousands are coming down. Because he's a sheepdog. Because that's what he's trained to do. The forebrain shuts down, the midbrain takes over. You're product of your instincts, you're training. All that's true. But I want to give you the scientific solution to the question, why will men and women go toward their death? When no one is watching, when people try to stop you, why will men and women go toward their death? In the heart of darkness, in the midnight of our souls, why will men and women go toward their death? Here's what we know. In nature, the one place where the powerful natural instinct of self-preservation is consistently canceled out across many different species can be seen in a mama critter. Across many different species, a mama critter will die for one thing. What is it? Her baby should go. Yeah. In combat, we know if we throw a, a group of strangers in the front lines, Men and women don't know each other, don't care about each other. As soon as it's dark, as soon as people are dying, they're out of there. You put together a band of brothers and sisters. Men and women who know and trust one another, they'll fight long and hard. Why? For each other. Audie Murphy is the most decorated American soldier in World War II. Audie Murphy was asked one time why he did it. His answer was very simple. They were killing my friends. All this research revolves around one word. Now, at the end of the day, I want to pull that word down and embrace it. There's a book called The Gates of Fire about the Spartans at Thermopylae. But I read it, Gates of Fire, on the Commandant's list, along with my books. In fact, uh, it, it poses a question at the beginning of the book. What is the opposite of fear? Think about it. What quenches fear as water? quenches fire. And the answer? Love quenches fears. Water quenches fire. The one force on this planet stronger than the instinct is self-preservation. The mama critter loves her babies more than life itself. Audie Murphy loved his fellow soldiers more than life itself. And Christopher Amoroso, he loves his fellow citizens, men and women trapped in those towers. Men and women he's never met more than life itself. Now, here's the crazy part, folks. The mama critter will die to save her babies. She won't die to save anybody else's babies. 
We're saying in the Sheepdog Kids book, the sheep will die to protect the ones they love. Only the sheepdog loves enough to die for other people's loved ones. Only the sheepdog loves enough to die for other people's loved ones. You believe in who you are. You believe in what you do. For greater love hath no one than this. And we were not given a spirit of fear, but of love. Here's the crazy part, folks. Absolutely blows me away. I used this photograph with permission for a decade after 9-11 of Christopher Amoroso. Then someone told me what the name Amoroso means. Amor is love. Amoroso is the lover, the one who loves. But we wrap up the Sheepdog Kids book by saying they're not heroes because they die. They're heroes because they walk out the door every day prepared to lay down their life. Sometimes the greatest love is not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. To place the welfare of others ahead of your own. To walk out the door every day of your life. To do a dirty, dangerous, thankless task to the utmost of your ability every day of your life because you know if nobody did it, our civilization would no longer exist. Not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. The most of our lives are great, it's love. And so I wrap up the day with one last model for action. It's a simple story about a young paratrooper drew a line in the snow on Christmas Eve in 1944 in the Battle of the Bulls. There other dark hours. Other Americans asked to make a stand. I tell you folks, things are bad. They're going to get a hell of a lot worse. But there have been other dark hours. World War II, December 1944, the Battle of the Bulge. The Nazis had shattered a large portion of the American lines. The German armored units are cutting deep into our rear. Their goal was to cut back and capture the one fully functional deep water port we had in Northern Europe. If the Nazis cut back and captured that port, they would cut up our supply lines. Millions of Allied troops would be trapped without food, without fuel, without ammo, the fate of the world, the fate of the war hung in the balance. The paratroopers from the 82nd 101st Airborne Division pulled out of reserve. They marched day and night to form blocking positions on the little roads coming out of the Ardennes Forest. And those young, elite, lightly equipped airborne troops, they had the authority and the responsibility and the mission to rally together the fleeing Americans and to stop the Nazi advance, and that's exactly what they did. There was a photographer there, captured the moment. An American tank is fleeing down the road, 30 tons off down, running down the road with the Nazis on his heels. One young character was down beside the road. He's got hollow sunken eyes and three days growth of beard. He's got a bazooka slung or a backhead rifle by his side. He walked out the snow and he held up his hand and he stopped the tank. He said, hey buddy, are you looking for a safe place? The guy said, yeah. He said, then park your tank behind me, because I'm the airborne. And this is as far as the bastards are going. <laughs> now, do you understand how this story applies to you? For the rest of your lives, you'll be faced with people who flee. They're fleeing tyranny and oppression, terrorism and violence, and the fear that lurks in the hearts of every man, woman, and child. And you are the authority and the responsibility and the mission to stand up and say, friend, neighbor, brother, sister, are you looking for a safe place? Now tell you, yeah, oh yeah. You tell them, you tell them, then get behind me because I am the United States Air Force and this is as far as the bastards are going. And as you do that, for the rest of your lives, and God bless you, your family, every endeavor, and God bless America. Thank you. sacrifice a lot, uh, to lead that life of sacrifice, and ask you to deploy, and ask you to take lives every single day.
uh, what you do is just. And as a result of that, you're going to have a sense of purpose. There are going to be Americans that come home because of your actions, probably his, his son. And I'm going to ask you to go down to, uh, to places where uh, very few will go. So uh, but just passing words. I uh, look forward to hearing this again tomorrow. Okay. And if anyone would like to come up and talk to Dave afterward. But uh, the last thing I'll say is just thank you. So, uh, so I appreciate what you do. Uh, and you're all hunters at heart. All right. Thanks. I'll build it up tomorrow, guys. Get a video. Rock and roll. Thank you, Colonel. I'll hang around if you need. God bless you.